Okay. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. Can you see that? Yes, let's try presenting. Then you sh we should see your presentation screen. So if I do presentation. Mode. Yes. And this little thing that says stop sharing or hide, just click. Ah, uh, we do see your task bar though. But maybe if you move your mouse away or click it on the. Um, yeah, that's okay, the task bar, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, yeah, that actually that works beautifully. Okay. In any case, yeah, so we'll have what happens. We may or may not get people joining in. Those are the ones that may want to uh, ask questions live. Either way, I'll ask you questions or, you know. Okay. If I get questions on my side uh, by chatting, I'll uh, forward them to you. Um, does that sound reasonable? That sounds good. Awesome. Yeah. Well, then, yeah, then let me just leave to our time. So let me just, uh, it's already streaming, so let me just start recording. And it'll take a second. So, hey everybody, I'd love to introduce uh, Jeff Kares from uh, Stanford University and the Mineral X Project, where I, mean, I guess to summarize, you wanna make sure that uh, uh, you know, geology and minerals are available to all. Well, welcome. Thank you, Craig, uh, and uh, glad to be here. Um, so in my presentation, I'll talk uh, more generally about intelligent agents and how such technology can be used to accelerate the energy transition and then specifically uh, talk about our uh, new program, Mineral X. Okay, wrong slide. Of course, I'd like to start by acknowledging um, uh, my collaborators. Uh, we have a growing uh, group on Mineral X. Uh, and we're also collaborating with the Stanford Intelligent Systems Lab at, uh, uh, that is led by Michael Kochendorfer and professor in aeronautics and astronautics. Uh, also mentioned a lot of collaboration of, uh, with OMV, which is an energy company in uh, Austria, and also with Cobalt Metals, which is a startup uh, in the space of mineral exploration. So yeah, let's talk about energy and energy transition. And as many people, uh, now thinking about, uh, well, let's go to 100% renewable energy. And I'll mention that in a little bit. And so I, in doing so, um, I was also thinking about what would be the essential ingredients to, to achieve this uh, transition. And if you look at that, the, the answer uh, would be four major categories, uh, wind and solar, uh, water for hydropower, the Earth's heat, uh, geothermal, both for shallow as well as deep geothermal, and then earth materials or earth minerals. And so of all of these components, uh, it is the last component here, earth minerals, that is probably the most critical uh, in terms of uh, getting the right supply or getting the supply for those earth minerals. So let's talk a little bit about these uh, various components. Um, one that's often not uh, looked at is, is that of uh, geothermal, uh, shallow geothermal or low enthalpy geothermal for heating. Um, and cooling. Uh, and as you know, with climate change and the increase in um, droughts and, and, and extreme uh, temperatures, uh, it was actually um, a piece in the Wall Street Journal, I think, a couple of days ago about how China is increasing coal uh, burning because of the high temperatures. And so cooling was, uh, is, um, you know, a big issue. Now in China, most cooling and heating is done, there's no distributed gas. So there's mostly done through through electricity, uh, and so electricity is generated by coal. Uh, and so in large areas such as the Yangtze River Delta, which hosts 235 million people, uh, we're collaborating there to uh, to look into uh, transitioning into uh, geothermal heating. More, uh, it's closer to a smaller uh, area in the world uh, that we're actually collaborating already in terms of uh, engineering projects is in Vienna. Uh, Vienna it's, uh, sits in a, a basin, it's actually an oil and gas basin, uh, and in the basin uh, there are, are some shallower heat sources. Now this is not as shallow as uh, we would have for heat pumps, this is uh, probably a few thousand, this is actually a few thousand feet below the, the surface. And so what we try to do there is to uh, circulate water into the subsurface, uh, use the subsurface as a heat exchanger and then uh, use that for for district heating. And so these are uh, large uh, projects, uh, engineering projects. Uh, these are projects uh, that 
uh, tap into the subsurface. Here we see that kind of layer, so to speak, in in, in uh, Vienna, below Vienna, um, where you see temperatures uh, reaching to about uh, a shallow or to about uh, 80 to 90 degrees centigrade. Now that's good enough for, for heating. It's not good enough for energy production. So for energy production, you need to go much deeper and you need to go to about 150 degrees uh, centigrade. Now, geothermal heating um, requires injecting fluids in the subsurface, uh, and that you know that is uh, to in order to engineer that you have to build subsurface models in 3D, uh, and this is an example shown here. But also, what is shown in this example um, is that there are faults uh, here. You see these stripes here; these are faults in the subsurface. Uh, so, injecting fluids into faults or near faults is not not desirable. Uh, for this reason here, this was uh, an earthquake recorded in Pohang, South Korea, a magnitude 5.4, which is significant, as you see. And this is due to geothermal energy production. Uh, and the reason here, as explained on the right-hand side, is that as you inject uh, fluids in the subsurface, you change pressures. Uh, once you see pressures on faults, you may get slip, and slip causes earthquakes. Uh, and so knowing that this is going to happen and how is this going to happen is, of course, a very important and a very important design of the safety issues related to geothermal energy production as well as shallow geothermal. Uh, it's one of the critical issues for geothermal uh, because you can imagine uh, if there is even a small earthquake in Vienna, that will be the end of geothermal energy in Vienna, and that is something that's not desirable. Another major component of the energy transition is that of uh, industrial heat. Uh, there are many. Um, uh, alternatives there such as electrical furnaces uh, and one of the alternatives that people are promoting is that of combining combustion with underground storage uh, so this capture and storage also known as CCS or CCUS uh, and putting it underground is called geological storage or GCS uh, so that requires capturing the CO2 which needs uh, to done which uh, requires amine plants uh, and then storing it underground in a supercritical form. So there you have a double jeopardy uh, if you start doing that, uh, and that is to do with leakage. Uh, so the safety issue there is related to injecting fluids in the subsurface that may leak uh, over time uh, through faults into uh, probably groundwater systems. And uh, so this is a more of a waste storage issue um which uh, you could say is is somewhat similar to nuclear waste storage is that you need to guarantee that this uh this leakage is has very low probability over very long time periods uh and so that is also a critical aspect of this uh design uh, aspect okay so then we uh talk about also the minerals and the circular materials economy uh where we are replacing ice vehicles with electrical vehicles. And I'm sure you've seen many articles about that in the newspaper. And there are a number of critical elements um, that are uh, appearing here. I would say the most critical of these is lithium today, um, because lithium uh, is the dominating element in lithium ion batteries. And lithium ion batteries are going to be around for now a significant amount of time. People say at least one decade, if not more. Uh, in order to build motors uh, and build electrification, you need copper. So I'd say copper is a second uh, critical element here. Uh, a good alternative to cobalt is nickel. Uh, you know that some electrical vehicles use um, LM, um, uh, use batteries that contain nickel. Um, there's also iron-based ba batteries. They don't have nickel, but they are less performing. So. Nickel and cobalt uh, have to do a lot with the performance of uh, electrical vehicles. Now, uh, that's where uh, our new group comes in, the Middle X. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, where we collaborate with cobalt metals uh, to increase uh, the discovery of these critical elements. Now, this is quite uh, challenging. Uh, and as you see here, the top graph uh, is sort of the decline over the last couple of decades in the ratio of success uh, for uh, mineral exploration. So this de decline is tenfold. In fact, in the last two decades, there are no major new copper mine has been discovered. Uh, and people continue mining increasingly low-grade deposits, which is very harmful uh, for the environment. 
So, so we'll talk later a little bit about how we try to find minerals and how do we find use artificial intelligence uh, to do so. So, in that in that sense, for critical minerals, there are a number of very sobering facts. Uh, is that number one is that the United States is absolutely not ready to secure its own critical mineral supply. Uh, a lot has to do with the fact that um, to go from a discovery to a mine takes at least ten years uh, in the United States, uh, and so that's not fast enough. Uh, secondly, there is almost no attention paid over the last two decades uh, on critical minerals. Uh, lots of the effort in energy in the United States has been on fossil fuels. Um, and so that's we are very, very far behind many uh, other countries. Uh, as I mentioned, this critical mineral discovery efficiency has been uh, declining. And so that's a major concern. And so therefore, uh, you can almost say that uh, this resilient decarbonized and, you know, just critical mineral supply uh, remains very uncertain. Uh, by just, I mean, uh, essentially that there is an environmental justice concern uh, that, you know, we should not be getting these minerals out of poor countries and then drive very expensive vehicles in the West. Uh, so, uh, so this whole issue around the resources curse uh, remains very important. And that's something that our group uh, wants to contribute to as well. In terms of recycling, I get that question a lot. Recycling is not going to be important in the, in the short term, uh, simply because of the second and third life of, of lithium ion batteries. For example, lithium ion batteries uh, have a second life as a storage battery. Uh, and so that means that any serious recycling is only going to kick, kick, kick in by 2035 or later. So then the question we can ask ourselves, OK, what, what is now really needed uh, to make this energy transition a success? And what are plans uh, that are available and how can we execute these plans? Now, there are many plans, of course, available that have been promoted by uh by the ipcc or the international energy agency or even fossil fuel companies um and so i i'm looking at two plans however that are very different uh and i'm a big believer in these two plans uh these two plans actually look very similar uh the one is by mark jacobson who is a professor here at the door school of sustainability and um he says that we have all the technology mostly there uh, lithium ion batteries, uh, let's say geothermal heat pumps, um, wind and solar, um, hydropower, lots of this, um, you know, green hydrogen, uh, lots of this is already there. And so this, the technology of today can be used. So that's good news, right? We don't need any, uh, at least according to him, and I agree with that, we don't need miracle technologies. Uh, on the other side, you see Tesla's master plan, uh, which came out in April this year, which looks very similar. Uh, and that master plan also doesn't call for any fossil fuels, uh, doesn't call for uh, for those things. And also it calls a little bit more for uh, nuclear that uh, Mark Jacobson is not very in favor. So you can ask yourselves, OK, what is then really needed if you know everything is there? And so my uh, take on that is that we need to scale this, accelerate this. We need to build infrastructure. We need to source the material, optimize system and, of course, create the right policies for investment. And so these are what I call intelligence decisions. And so then the question is, how can we make such complex intelligence decisions, intelligent decisions? So my take on that is that making complex decisions over long time horizons require artificial intelligence. Um, and humans, because simply humans aren't good uh, at making very long, number one, uh, deciding or judging, uh, making judgments under uncertainty over very long time horizons. Uh, and that's been very well documented. It's not just my opinion. It's been very well documented by uh, two Nobel Prize winners in economy, uh, Tversky and Kahneman. They talked about uh, judgment under uncertainty and how uh, people are very biased uh, in the way they reason uh, about the future and about data. Uh, and so that, that comes into the heart of, uh, uh, of artificial intelligence. So when I talk about artificial intelligence, I want to make clear that, um, that we we agree on the uh, this categorization here, uh, which is the AI. We, we that's a big buzz right now is, is of course the the predictive and generative AI, um, and so that has an important role into into what I do. But the most important role is the decision making AI. Uh, ChatGPT doesn't make decisions, uh, so we need to build agents 
uh, that can make intelligent decisions and reason, act, and adapt in, in a real environment. So more talking about kind of robotic type AI or chess playing AI or game AI, uh, that's the AI I will be mostly talking about. So let's uh, now go and check how, as I mentioned in the abstract, um, how um, we have uh, essentially um, implemented some of this AI into uh, into this uh, energy transition. Question. Yeah. Uh, as you go th uh, through this, it seems like a major challenge even before AI is understanding how supply chains work. Uh, you know which ports are available to get minerals from let's say australia to um argentina yeah. uh some details are you know they, they, they can multiply so how do you account for all the complications of you know real economies yeah i'll talk about that at the end very good question awesome. uh, yeah absolutely talk about that at the end um okay so how can ai accelerate uh this transition to renewable or help accelerate this transition um, so the first thing to think about that is that planning in, in, in exploration engineering, and then later on, I'll talk about mineral supply chains, uh, that humans are slow and have limited time horizon, right? And so artificial intelligence is really great at long, plan, long time horizon planning and including reasoning with uncertainty. And uncertainty is key to all of this, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, I like to use this analogy, I, you know, every time I wake up in the morning and I just reach my 100-day 100, 100, uh, streak at uh, the rural game, uh, you know, we play rural, we can play rural with five letters, um, relatively smart, uh, and there's an AI, as you know, behind this as well, you can compare yourself with, uh, but think about uh, playing this game in German, uh, which, as you know, the word for computer in German is data for Arbeitungsmaschinen, and so imagine playing that word and that only the probability of the letters is revealed to you. Uh, so not even whether the letter is there or yes or not with certainty. So that is the kind of problems I'm trying to solve. Uh, so, so these problems uh, like CO2 injection or planning of mineral supply chains, uh, long-term planning uh, are essential because sequential planning on uncertainty uh, problems. And so these are problems where we need to make decisions uh, today over actions that are going to play, take place in time in the future. And uh, when it comes down to subsurface operations, we typically uh, would look into actions of uh, injecting, but then also action of monitoring. And that monitoring is required because of the safety issues that I mentioned. So the monitoring could then monitor the fluids uh, in the subsurface as they accumulate. Uh, but of course, this is not known with certainty. Uh, actually, there's quite a lot of uncertainty around that because we do not know perfectly the subsurface uh, structures that are there or porosity within which these fluids are going to be contained. So the question, therefore, is how do we uh, choose sites to inject? And so in, in one site, you may have different injection wells. And what kind of monitoring uh, do we uh, do? Uh, and so there, there's many choices. You can have very uh, very uh, expensive, uh, accurate monitoring, uh, but that's often not, you know, something that's feasible uh, over the long time. Uh, and then you have more inaccurate monitoring uh, that is more extensive. So you, you're trading off uh, precision versus uh, accuracy here. So here's a, a, a sort of a mock-up example uh, where we're going to inject into the subsurface here. Uh, into the system and there are faults on the side. And so you don't want to reach these faults because then you get leakage to the subsurface. Uh, now, here you see uh, th what the AI does. Uh, number one, I'd like you to focus on these gray curves. This is the uncertainty on the top surface. So this is realistic uncertainty uh, because we do not measure exactly the position of these uh, surfaces because uh, the, the, the geophysical measurements are limited in, in doing so. Uh, so the agent decides here to inject into this black location uh, at a certain rate. So this is all decided. And at the same time, it decides to monitor here with these blue arrows are the locations where you're going to be monitoring. And monitoring will reveal more about where the fluid is and will also reveal more about uncertainty on these surfaces. Uh, so you see this is not a, a trivial uh, solution. Uh, 
uh, and it is also a solution that needs to be include the time element. So uh, you could say, well, this seems like an optimization problem. Well, it's more difficult than an optimization problem. It's a sequential optimization problem that happens over time. Uh, what that means is that in the that you to the present decision where you inject today and where you're going to plan monitoring today will need to take into account that in the future you will get information. So you see that there's a feedback loop of information in the future to optimize the the um, the uh, the decision today, and that is not a trivial uh, exercise. This is not a simple optimization problem. And so the reward is at the at here on the right hand side is that you want to maximize the trap volume and of course minimize or even set to zero the exited volume. So with this example, we can start thinking okay, about yeah. So are you? I mean, this looks a lot like a Gaussian process, like in this illustration. But is it, that it, your it is, approach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's more like that, uh, and uh, do you use like uh, more hardcore simulations that are more expensive, but you know harder to, more expensive to work with? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, number one, I'd say that the right. geological uncertainty is a whole lot more complex than this very simple, uh, and I'll go right. back to that, right? So that's number one, that's a hard problem. I'll talk about that. The second is indeed that in the real cases, which we'll show you in the next, uh, we're dealing with uh, physical simulators uh, that are very slow because when you're injecting CO2, you get miscible flow. And so this is, uh, you know, needs a very high resolution uh, to get that resolved. And so we're also looking with proxy models and, and I'll talk about that as well. Okay. And then like if you do simulation, should I be thinking that you have like you have one measurement and you say, well, here's the possible ways it might work out. Then put another measurement on there. Here's a, like like a game kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll show. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'll show how that game is played uh, right. here in the next slides. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to th think about, therefore, uh, not so about the algorithms, uh, because I think it's very important to think about the formulation of this problem. Uh, so the formulation of this problem, and then think about the algorithms that solve this formulation. Uh, so there, if you think about this problem, there are four major components that are distinct. Uh, number one is that uh, we have to get to a certain reward at the end, which has many components. Some of these may be conflicting. Uh, there are actions that are taking place in the real world. So drilling is an action, injecting is an action. Uh, and then there are observations. Uh, then, sorry, then you have uh uncertainty right on one hand side so uncertainty is a very complex issue and i'll come back to that it's not a simple uncertainty because we're dealing with the 3d earth uh which consists of faults and layers and porosity and probability and rocks and and fluids and and all kind of stuff and chemistry and uh so lots of complexity there but then also we have observations that can help us uh, reduce that uncertainty now we only want to reduce uncertainty to the point that it actually affects the choice of the actions and that is based on the reward uh so so this is all interconnected and the interconnection is this one which is this um dynamic decision network uh that says that if you're going to take an action uh at some time t minus one that's going to lead to an observation uh and then the next action you take is going to lead to a reward but that reward is uncertain uh so that means that there's uncertainty in that reward and so we have to account for that uncertainty and that observations are going to help us in reducing that uncertainty. And so in, in AI, uncertainty is also called belief. Uh, and so this is this is kind of this is that decision diagram uh, that uh, with the next action, with the current action, the current observation, you can then update the belief into a, a new belief. And so this plays over time. And then at the end, you get the final reward. And the final reward needs then to be discounted to the present. Uh, and then you need to solve this problem, right? To solve this, uh, what, what combination of actions uh, would you take in the future uh, in order to maximize the reward? And so the outcome of this is a policy, uh, which is uh, the prescribed actions uh, given the states that you're in in order to maximize uh, a reward. And so, so this is very similar to playing chess. Uh, except that uh, in chess, you observe pretty much everything accurately. Uh, actually, you do. So the way that is solved, and this is what you were talking about earlier, is that we need to start uh, with uh, trying to find those uh, actions, observation uh, combinations uh, that lead us to an optimal reward. Now, the problem is that as you go over time and you 
uh, you know, you start with a certain observation that leads to an action, which then itself uh, leads to more observations, which leads to also possible actions. You see that this is exponentially in, uh, exploding, in particular because in our my problems that I work with, uh, everything is pretty much infinite dimensional. Uh, the Earth has billions of parameters. Uh, you can put the location of the wells in a large amount of possibilities. You can inject with large amount of possibilities of, of rates and, and whatnot. Uh, so this is kind of shows here on the right hand side uh, is is this uh, this visualization of this observation action pairs. Uh, and so the way that is solved uh, is with typically Monte Carlo tree search solvers. So this is a family of algorithms that is, it looks to exploit uh, those uh, action observation pairs that lead to uh, ex very high expected reward. And so that itself is a whole field of computer science and, and AI that I collaborate with uh, Michael Kochendorfer in order to, to do that. So if you look at that, uh, so we, we submitted this uh, paper to Nature, uh, I think uh, in, in, in June, uh, and what was critical about the outcome of this is if that, if, if you, number one, if you assume no uncertainty, you will get leakage. If you assume, uh, that you're optimizing under uncertainty using, uh, let's say, closed loop optimization. You don't use, but the problem there is that you're predicting you don't have leakage, but in reality, you do get leakage. Uh, it's only when you formulate a problem as this partially observable Markov decision problem, which is the graph I showed in the previous slide, and when you start using proper uncertainty quantification methods, here sequential important resampling with, with rigorous uh, Monte Carlo research, it's only in those circumstances that we find there is no leakage. Uh, so that also shows that this interaction between data in the future and the current operations is actually quite important. So now we go and apply that to uh, with OMV, which is that Austrian oil company, and do that in actual field work. Can tell you much about this because there's a lot of sensitivity around injecting CO2 uh, in the subsurface. Still, uh, you know, this license to operate in the in the areas within this uh, with this case lies, and this case is a depleted gas reservoir. So these are gas reservoirs uh, and contain natural gas. They have now been depleted. Uh, went from 100 bar to 10 bar, and so now uh, you can re-inject uh, the CO2 in there. So this is one of the one of the great opportunities uh, for CO2 injection, but it's not without risk. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, subsurface contained faults. Uh, the reservoir has been depleted, so now you like a balloon, right? And now you blow it up again. So what's going to happen to the rocks? Uh, are they going to, uh, what are the geomechanical uh, properties and, and what are stresses and strains that are going to happen as you start injecting. Uh, <clears throat> so monitoring is very important and where to place monitoring wells. In this case, we have 18 wells in this old gas reservoir. So we can use existing wells to monitor and then we can use uh, existing wells to inject. And so uh, now come back to your issue of the four modeling. So in order to make predictions of reward, we need to build subsurface models. Uh, and there's uncertainty in the structure and there's uncertainty in, in the rocks that we have to account for. And then we forward simulate that. Uh, but that forward simulation takes a lot of time. And so when you're doing uh, an AI solver, you may need hundreds of thousands of forward models. Uh, and so using actual physical simulator doesn't work. And so that's where uh, <coughs> we, uh, we use um, deep learning uh, techniques uh, in order to uh, to predict or replace that forward model. And that's actually not as, as trivial because uh, the forward model is uh, not just function of the physics uh, of the problem, it's also a function of the location of the wells. And so the location of the wells is something you need to search over. Uh, so you need a, a forward model that's not just replicating the physics, it's also replicating the physics over a whole set of possible future boundary conditions uh, and so that's uh, quite an important uh, work. And so, so that's uh, where one of our students uh, that we collaborated with uh, has done a quite an uh, interesting contribution. So question, you yeah. say you do 100,000, hundreds of thousands of runs for one of these studies. How many do you need to train one of these surrogates? Uh, 8,000. 8,000, okay. Yeah. That's uh, much better, at least. That's much better, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the accuracy of the surrogacy is actually quite important. So we trained first with 2000 and it didn't work uh, mm -hmm. because the surrogate model wasn't accurate enough. Uh, and because of the sensitivity to the leakage 
uh, and leakage being a low probability event, uh, you know, it's you actually have to have quite uh, accurate surrogates in order for this to to work. Okay, and then the other thing is you presumably have to um, bound the space of possible geologies and boundary conditions pretty well. You you want to. Um, do you like just randomly sample different kinds of geologies? Do you have a curated set? Do you it's an, it's an adaptive? You generate geologies to where you seem to have be, been getting errors. Yeah, so we just uh, submitted a paper on importance sampling uh, for 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 creating cases. Uh, if you do random sampling, you can create a whole bunch of cases you don't need to have. Uh, so we are we employ importance sampling that creates cases. Uh, that are interesting cases that uh, in cases where you have leakage, you need to predict it very accurately. In cases where you don't have leakage, it's just you don't really worry about those cases. Uh, so important sampling uh, can actually reduce the amount of simulations you need by tenfold relative to naive Monte Carlo sampling. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of work there done as well. And are generative models useful here to generate, you know, useful uh, subsurface geologies? Um, not in this is uh, generating the yeah so we 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 do work on generative models for subsurface, uh, but not in this case because uh, this case the generation of the models is very fast, uh, so so generative models um, <clears throat> could come in for example, in uh, in solving inverse problems, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because uh, if if the inverse sim simulators are are slow too. Uh, but here we use particle uh, filters and sequential importance resampling. So again, we're combining importance sampling uh, with particle filters in order to produce particle sets that solves the inverse problem very fast. Uh, because the solving the inverse problem itself is difficult because you're observing a concentration uh, and at a certain location, and you need to back out uh, the surface topography, the uh, the saturation, as well as the porosity of the system. Uh, so, so these inverse problems themselves are quite challenging. No, that, that makes sense. Uh, what I was thinking gener generative was if you need to do uh, important sampling, and I would think I mean, you, unless you have a library of many geologies, which actually you may, you need yeah. to generate a bunch of geologies. Now, I'm not sure how difficult this is. This is easy. Ah, yeah. okay. This, this is easy. super easy. Yeah, this is super easy. So it's like a matter of saying, here's some layers, here's a crack, and you're done. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, um, we in this case, those uh, are, you know, they're constrained by geophysical data, but then in order to simulate the, the high resolution component, we use Gaussian processes in this particular case. Okay, that makes sense. So, Thank you. There are cases where, where you need to model complicated geometries of, of stratigraphy layering or 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 fishes means rocks uh and so so there often people use more of the generative approach the, okay yeah I, I see the difference you usually have fairly stable kind of formations and so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. in this setting yeah okay so here you got then the answer uh which is the three locations where to inject and the one location in order to monitor uh and so this is not intuitive at all right so you see that uh it injects uh in three different periods uh, and then it where would you why would you put this monitoring world there uh and so so that is what this ai uh can decide and uh so this is uh being implemented now for for this specific site okay so we talked about earth's heat let's now talk and talk about earth's uh materials and so now the whole idea is to keep the exact same formulation. This is the power, I think, of all of this, is we're not changing formulation because the formulation is that of sequential planning under uncertainty. So now instead of doing uh, safety and uh, subsurface injection, uh, when you go to Earth's minerals and say you would like to discover materials then that eventually need to be mined, uh, that is also a sequence of actions. Uh, in, in fact, we'll talk a little bit more about mineral exploration, why that is a sequence of actions that is taking place in time, but also mining and then eventually supply chains are also a set of sequence of actions that need to be done uh, in, in time in order to build them. So a little bit about, uh, about uh, mineral deposits, uh, because this may not be so well known. Uh, so mineral deposits and metal deposits in particular, there are many different kinds. Uh, the kind that we are looking for are high-grade deposits. And the reason we're looking for those is that they 
uh, and I'll show an example of that in a bit, is that their environmental footprint of mining is so much smaller than a low-grade deposit. You can imagine that if you're mining uh, a nickel laterite deposit in Indonesia, uh, which has 0.2% nickel, that means that 99.8% of what you mine is waste. And so the, the question is, where does the waste go? Uh, so you're basically clearing out the rainforest, uh, number one, the topsoil, and then you're sitting putting the topsoil back. Uh, and so you can imagine the, the environmental destruction that go with that. We're looking for, uh, in my group, we're looking for these hard rock uh, massive sulfides, which contain nickel, copper, cobalt. And these uh, things are below the ground, which is, makes them hard to find, but they are very small uh, in super high concentrations of you know, nickel percent, three, four percent nickel. Uh, as you see, that's better than 0.3% nickel. Um, and so this can be mined underground. So these uh, deposits are formed through intrusions. And these intrusions, they bring uh, magmatic fluids uh, to, the sub to the surface uh, through where areas where the crust is thinning. And think about uh, mid-continental rift areas uh, where then these fluids interact with sulfur in the, in the continental crust. And then deposits uh, in chambers, uh, either in intrusions or even lava tubes, uh, and and they can and then they settle to the, to the the bottom because these are very heavy things, and so sometimes they concentrate in significant form to, to form an ore or deposit. Now finding that um, it requires uh, a lot of effort, and you can imagine it almost starts from space. Uh, here we see, we have the mid-continental rift system, which is uh, the border between Canada and the United States, which you can see from space, and you can actually see the rifting. Uh, but then you're looking for something here on the right-hand side uh, that is uh, at a much smaller scale, which is the intrusion. Uh, so it's a top view of the intrusion. Uh, and then you go to the area where you want to do more prospecting, and then you need to put loops underground uh, where you can do geophysics. Uh, but eventually you have to start drilling and that's where where the expense comes uh, because drilling requires a lot of equipment it requires permitting um, you know and sometimes you can't access the area well uh, these are in very remote area for example we are we're exploring in the in the arctic uh, above the arctic circle where there's absolutely no roads whatsoever and you bring in planes to do the drilling so you can imagine this is expensive it takes a lot of time so a question um... yeah when you say intrusion, it sounds like you mean, I mean, because it's an aerial feature, which is surprising to me. Yeah. It sounds like it's just one of those processes, like a lava tube, that creates a void underground that makes it even plausible for minerals to accumulate. Is that right? Exactly the case. So so that doesn't mean there are minerals there. It means that there's a possibility of minerals. There's many of these intrusions that contain absolutely no minerals. So you, you're looking for uh, uh, surface signs of underground voids. That's one, yeah, for these massive sulfides, uh, we're looking for indeed uh, what are called voids that are filled with mafic rocks. So rocks mm -hmm. that have high iron magnesium content or ultra mafic rocks, very and high. We have a place for the minerals to drip over millions of years. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly, yeah. Got it. This one happened uh, 1.3 billion years ago. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's not recent. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, the problem, as I mentioned, this is in the subsurface. So, so a lot of these uh, surface expressing deposits have been found. So now we're looking for uh, things that are in the subsurface. So it means, you know, you have a layer of sediment. You can stand on, on a piece of dirt uh, and say, well, below our feet could be something. But And so geophysical measurements come in as very important. But of course, a lot of things look like an ore body. And so the way we try to discover ore bodies is looking for specific geophysical signatures, this high connectivity, magnetic susceptibility, and all of these things. But a lot of things look like that. Uh, you know, graphite looks <laughs> it's very conductive. Uh, so many companies have drilled into graphite. Uh, and so you have what is called high false positive rates. And so, so what we uh, work a lot on is how can you really start rethinking the idea of mineral exploration? And so I've come up with the idea of what's called Bayesian mineral exploration, because I found that uh, uh, mining companies or exploration companies tend to want to confirm their expectations of where the mineral deposit is. Uh, and confirming expectations when you have a rare event leads to extremely high false positive rates. That's been 
basically one of Popper's contribution, uh, saying that in order to predict something very rare, you need you need uh, counter you need um, evidence uh, that is trying to falsify your hypothesis. Uh, so, as you were mentioning in the previous slide, uh, it's it's not just about confirming the presence; it's also by making geological hypotheses about the voids and and the system of, of where the mineral system of how that was created and then try to find falsifying evidence and most companies don't do that most companies find try to find confirming evidence and so with cobalt metals uh we've done come the completely opposite way and say we need to first falsify hypothesis and then try to confirm them uh and so that's kind of an, a revolution in this world uh that is called bayesian mineral exploration so we are using Bayes rule and we're using bayesianism but um but one of the key points in all of this is the the model is really driven uh, not by a 3d model but it's really driven by geological hypothesis uh is that we really don't understand very well uh the formation of these mineral deposits and therefore we really don't understand well the geometries within which these uh end up being and why for example one uh intrusion has absolutely nothing and another intrusion has you know a lot of minerals so we don't really understand that so we need to formulate hypothesis and try to find evidence to falsify them before confirming them so that means it's all about the sequence of future information gathering so now it's not just about let's do the next thing drill it's also about can we plan in the future so this is sequential planning under uncertainty so now we go back to our original formulation uh, and that's where we have built uh, uh, something completely new uh, in the mineral uh, resources industry, and it's called the intelligent prospector. So it is the same formulation as the CO2 or the geothermal case. It's a program that makes decisions, uh, you know, that are planned over time, where the current decision is going to take into account the fact that you're going to make many more actions in the future and we'll get information in the future right it's blind it's like playing chess you don't play chess one move at a time you don't do chess by closed loop optimization uh you need to do this in in this uh mark of decision process uh form now to do that you need a huge amount of information and so with uh, cobalt um you know we uh, we've worked a lot on, on ingesting uh, tens of thousands of 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 even written handwritten documents that go back to the Belgian Congo uh, time in Africa to look at uh, hand painted maps and, and, and things like that. Uh, because a lot of these areas, there's absolutely no information, uh, at least if you go look online in databases. And so ingesting that information and doing that in a rigorous way is itself uh, using NLP as a significant uh, uh, undertaking. But once you have that, you can start act on that information. And that is where uh, you know, I think with Cobalt, we have made a huge difference. And this was a, a big announcement that came in the US Africa Summit uh, that was held just last year, where Cobalt was um, in, was mentioned, or is a, uh, the company uh, went into a deal uh, with an investor in Zambia. Uh, and the reason why Com uh, Cobalt got this deal, which was $150 million investment in the copper belt in uh, Zambia. So this is an area of the world where you have a huge amount of copper and cobalt. Uh, cobalt comes from the north, which is uh, the DRC, as you know, and all the problems. And Zambia is a democratic country with a very different uh, regime and is in the south and has mostly copper. Uh, so the deal was made because uh, cobalt has proven uh, that they can accelerate um, the development of resources and the development of, of exploration orders of magnitude faster uh, than regular mining companies do today, and I'll show you what that is exactly. So here's a is a is a uh, a drill uh, bit uh, a drill well that is drilled uh, currently ongoing in Zambia by cobalt. So you see, you know, this is real uh, real life stuff, uh, and this is one of the first uh, wells or drill holes that were drilled using artificial intelligence to determine the location uh, and the angle of intersection. So what's going on? So imagine that you're here on the left-hand side, you are in Zambia, somewhere in the copper belt, and all the little dots you see here are the way that uh, mining companies today do exploration. Uh, so literally thousands and thousands of wells or drill holes are being drilled in order to make uh, assessment of whether or not you have an economic deposit that you can start developing. Uh, so what we do with cobalt is we don't do it that way at all. 
Uh, and I'm going to show you kind of a mock-up case of what is happening in Zambia because, of course, of the sensitivity of the issue, I can't really talk about the details. Uh, but here's what's happening. So you see that we don't drill on a grid and then wait for the results. We drill one at a time, uh, but the, and, and our reward is essentially trying to making sure that the uncertainty uh, of your on your risk, which is determined by some economic cutoff, which you see here, this red line, on the right hand side is sufficient for you to make a decision to go ahead or walk away with the mine. That is really the, the setting that we're looking into. And you see uncertainty is a key part because if you see initially there's lots of uncertainty and it looks like you know, you're know you sort of on the right hand side of the cutoff. Uh, but as you start building out the sequence of drilling, uh, you end up on the left hand side of the cutoff. And so you can see that uh, the sequence of drilling is not intuitive uh at all uh but it is very intuitive to the intelligent agent because it takes into account the fact that future information will help you uh improve on your current decision and so in doing that you end up with uh a, an order of magnitude here uh less drilling uh which is just in an enormous uh number one cost reduction and secondly also time right this can be done maybe in nine months instead of three years uh, and so that's an also a, a big advantage. So a question. So, so this, I mean, I, I'm trying to say, I mean, I, I mean, it's very positive. This, this sounds obvious and this is like exactly how it should be done. Yeah. Um, but I'm also thinking that the subsurface geology field has had like, I mean, some Bayesian approaches like Krieging for like a good century. So what was the gap that prevented them from using techniques like this until now? Well, I think the gap was that people were whole, the, the, the industry is, and it is not a scientific problem, it is the industry uh, is holding on to very conservative ways of doing. Uh, and so, so these, this is just a huge inertia. Uh, while you, um, you know, um, are of a more modern education, these, you know, people don't even know about AI or don't even know what machine learning is. Uh, the first time I met with major uh, mining companies, uh, in their exploration team, they did not know what machine learning was uh, and what it would do. Uh, most of the drilling was just basically gut feeling by a geologist or an expert. Uh, and so this moves this uh, uh, forward. Now, uh, a mining company, the problem with the mining companies uh, is that they don't have this vertical integration of data science, AI, geology, geophysics, which Cobalt Metals has, right? So there's a company now of all, more than 100 people uh, working on 50 assets in three continents uh, where there are teams of, of people that are expert in this particular thing uh, and also expert, the best world's best geologist. Uh, you just don't find that in the mining company. It's just not there. So it's it's, it's not Google, right? So uh, they don't have that, uh, that expertise whatsoever. Okay, so th then to what extent were they using simulations and kind of... And, uh, it, nothing at all, nothing. Nothing. That see that that one surprises me because that is a very established like just inverse model of what must be underground from your set wells. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's deterministic inverse modeling. Right, right. So I guess the, what you're saying is that the big breakthrough is the um, running it many times, adaptive decision making. That's the new thing. So the new thing is uncertainty. Okay. Uncertainty quantification. That's the new thing. So so they don't do uncertainty quantification. Period. And without that, you can't have Bayesian. And without that, you can have Bayes or you can do anything AI. And so to get them in the uncertainty world, because everyone's doing basically what is done is you do a deterministic geophysical inversion. You see an anomaly and you drill in the middle of the anomaly and you find nothing and you walk to the next one and you do that a hundred times. Okay. And that's, that's adaptive, but without uncertainty, it's kind of dumb. It's not adaptive because you don't learn anything. It's not adaptive. Because you find nothing there. There's nothing there. No. There's okay. nothing there. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah. To what extent is yeah. the cost of these simulations the bottleneck for uh, for uncertainty qualification? And what is it just the like, yeah, yeah. Oh, algorithms? No, no. And that's where you have to leverage high performance computing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we do here to run these, uh, solve these Monte Carlo tree search uh, methods. You need HPC. There's no way around that. Uh, so you need to, we use cloud computing, right? Say uh, Amazon, uh, sorry, uh, Cobalt use Amazon uh, web services and, and stuff like that and, and Google web services or, or whatnot, right? So they, they use those services to do that, but a mining company doesn't do that. 
Right. And then when you also have surrogates, those searches become much more uh, tractable or much larger because they're cheaper. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Thank you. Now, all companies are much better uh, at this. Uh, that must be what I was thinking of because, yeah, I, I yeah. think I've heard more of them using subscription. Not many companies. Not many. No. Okay. Okay, so then you can say, and I come back to what is what else uh, uncertainty planning is there? Well, all long-term horizon planning in energy system planning are planners under uncertainty. And so now uh, we are going and scaling this up uh, to all complete new uh, applications. And I'll come back to the, the question was asked earlier about the ports in Argentina and Australia, and where is the minerals gonna come from? Uh, so we are starting a very large project uh, around intelligent design of lithium supply chain. So now we're looking at uh, the supply all the way from exploration to recycling and building that up. Uh, and this is, of course, a significant project, right? Uh, you start to uh, see that. Now, the, we started lithium because lithium, uh, number one, is the most important one. And secondly, lithium uh, comes mostly from our allies. Uh, so 95% of all lithium for the United States, electrical vehicles and other applications come from Australia and South America. And so we are, uh, the Biden administration, uh, made a, a pact with Australian government only two, uh, only two months ago around considering the Australian as a U.S. domestic supply. Uh, now, there's lots of problems with that um, because right now the Chinese are heavily invested in Australia. And so there's a question now of how can we, um, you know, mitigate this issue of the Chinese dominating, uh, not so much the mining, but dominating the processing uh, because all of the, most of the ore processing uh, the ore gets shipped to China from Australia, gets processed there, the spodumene, and then gets shipped back to Australia. So you can see, see the domination of the Chinese in this in this area, right? And so what we like to do is to uh, to come up with uh, economically viable uh, using material flow analysis and system dynamics to build up these uh, supply chains such that, as you see on the right hand side, they meet certain criteria which we call rewards. Uh, which, you know, decarbonization is very important, resilience is important, social license to operate, so there's going to be social models involved. And the idea is to say, how can we uh, delay mining in the United States as long as possible? And the reason why we do that is because there is no license to operate in the United States for mining. Even if you say, I find a deposit, I want to mine tomorrow, it's, people just don't want it in their backyard. And so there has to be first this whole ramp up in the United States for I think at least 10 years before we can start doing any significant mining uh, and, and delay that as long as possible. Uh, but at the same time, leverage Australia, uh, particularly Australia, why Australia? Because Australia has all of the hard rock lithium, uh, which is different from the brine lithium in, in South America. The hard rock lithium is the future for lithium, uh, simply because we know that all the brine deposits and at some point they're gonna decline. And the hard rock lithium is the one that has the very large concentration of lithium. Spodumene has up to 8% uh, concentration. So how do you build this out? Um, this is a huge sequential planning uncertainty problem, requires lots of uh, analysis, and this is a five-year project uh, to say the least. And this will be uh, done in collaboration with the Australian uh, National Science Foundation, which is called CSI RO. So I wanna end up uh, here a little bit also with the human side and how in our program we're looking at building a community. Uh, we had a quite a successful uh, symposium uh, in June, uh, attended by uh, 200 people, uh, it was sold out. Um, we had people from car companies uh, like Tesla, as well as the major mining companies, Rio Tinto, BHP, as well as battery manufacturing companies, uh, but then also people from uh, areas affected by uh, mining, such as areas in Zambia and in the Salton Sea area, which is in California, uh, uh, where Lithium Americas and other companies are looking to to use geothermal brines to extract lithium. Uh, and so uh, this was also the launch of our industrial affiliates program, um, which is an, an, an it's an industrial affiliates program where we collaborate with companies. Uh, we have now six, seven members. Uh, some members are investment companies, uh, others are mining companies, others are uh, service companies, and, and so this is open to, uh, to everybody. Uh, and we are looking at environmental justice concerns. Uh, we have also, uh, I'll be traveling to, to Africa later this year and, and, and look at education 
Uh, we also have students of mine that are involved in Zambia and Antarctic, but also in mining in the rainforest uh, in, in Brazil and Indonesia. These are big issues. Uh, and mining is, is important, uh, but it is also has a bad name. And I think uh, one, one thing that people don't quite understand well is that not all mining is the same. Uh, so on the left-hand side is the high-grade nickel deposit I was talking about in Canada. And you see, you can see the, the, the mine, right? There's a couple of buildings. And the reason for that is it's mined underground uh, with high-precision mining. So you build tunnels and things like that where, the, where you can follow the ore deposit, right? You can do that underground. When you do open pit mining, uh, and this is neat, often done when you have very low-grade deposits, you're making these huge craters in the... In the uh, in the subsurface um, because he can do targeting, right? It's impossible. Uh, and this is the largest open pit gold mine. This is also a very low grade gold mine. Now we don't need gold. Uh, and where does this gold go? I always like to show that to people. This gold that comes out of this mine sits now in a bunker somewhere, right? This is this is the craziness of mining. So we're, we're trying to, to find more of uh, the high grade metals that are critical for for human survival not gold we have 200 years of gold reserves for for engineering and, and, and technology applications uh so we also work on, on education uh we're just coming out with a new book where lots of this mineral exploration and Bayesianism and and things are are being done as well as other types of uh of uh, applications and so yeah and so that's all what i got and uh, and happy to uh uh take any of your questions oh, that's fascinating thank you very much um i guess one thing i think you didn't go too deeply into this the supply chain model which i think is well, extremely challenging uh can you go into kind of the um considerations you have do you have to worry about the uh demand for uh lithium across the world the various uh, applications of lithium and where those users are the refining facilities yeah. how deep does it have to go I think we want to do that bottom up. I, we don't want to do any uh, sort of gross uh, economic analysis of you know two billion vehicles and so much lithium. We will really want to build this from the ground up. That means uh, indeed that we need to uh, do what is called material flow analysis, mm -hmm. uh, which is the analysis of how lithium makes itself into uh, into different materials. And the two materials right now is electrical vehicles and glass um, and so ceramics uh, but of course electrical vehicles is going to dominate uh, and then this question is uh, where's the demand going to go the question is where are the processing facilities uh, going to happen and then and then also um, what are the effects of improving and the efficiencies uh, on the on the processing and what effect does that have uh, where are you going to build the ports um, we also thinking of doing this for nickel uh, because nickel Nickel is in a way more, a little bit more interesting because nickel, most nickel comes out of Indonesia and, and Brazil in the rainforest. Uh, and so there's talk about, well, Indonesia wants to decarbonize because they have a lot of coal uh, and how are we gonna pay for that? Well, some people say, let's do more nickel mining in Indonesia, but that's, you know, is that a good idea? Uh, because if you do more nickel mining in Indonesia, that may, uh, this uh, this encourage people to do high grade nickel mining in Canada. So there's a, there's a lot of this feedback, uh, you know, balancing and reinforcing, and that's where we're going to use uh, this kind of system dynamics. Uh, really talk to economists and say what is, what are you expecting when we do this and this kind of incentives. And so the idea of the the intelligent design of the supply chain is to really run scenarios. Um, but do it really from the ground up. I mean, looking at specific resources, right? Looking at say, how much is there still in Australia? What is Australia doing in its terms of its reserves? What is America doing in terms of its reserve? When do we see that coming online? When should it come online? Where would you put the processing plans? Uh, and how much investment would that take? Uh, and for lithium, this is uh, very fascinating because you know there are now car companies or uh, end users uh, like Mitsubishi, they want to, they want to ally with cobalt metals to go mine in Canada, right? It's uh, it's, it's people want to buy parts of mining companies, so it's uh, it's uh, it's a very dynamic environment. So it, it makes a lot of sense. And is your use case? I mean, I guess I'm hearing two. One is more like a national lab says, "Here's the possible uh, outcomes for the world. Here's a few you know yeah. studies or maybe a tool that you can run your own simulations." 
or working with a conglomerate to actually execute a plan. No, no we are, we're not interested in scientific analysis. We're interested mm -hmm. in platform for conglomerates to to run these uh, because, you know, we have now uh, companies like Rio Tinto in our consortium. Uh, and so we're open to attract more other types of companies and particularly we have an investment company uh, now. And so, you know, uh, in, in next week I'm talking to Tesla. So, so you know, that's sign where we're in. We're aiming quite big with this. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, thank you very much. This is fascinating. Yeah, thank you. And, and how about Google? <laughs> I, I have no executive authority, but that may be. Okay. Yeah. I mean, certainly there's plenty of climate ambitions here, so that would yeah. be a very... Yeah, let me know important. how I can uh, unlock those ambitions. Yes, no, that, that's a good one. Yeah, thank you. All right, cool. Then, yeah, thanks and have a great rest of your day. Right. Yeah, same. Thank you. Bye. Bye.